I don't know how many of you have heard about Sky Falconry. I have forever, and this is really a treat to have them with us today. Um, have any of you been there before? Good. Well, this is Denise Disherin and Kirk Selinger. They're going to talk today about their training and their background and how they came to have this business here in Alpine. Um, the Historical Society, this is not a typical historical meeting, but we are trying to target unique businesses in Alpine just to give them some notoriety. So without further ado. Hi, I'm Denise. And I'm Kirk. And we at Sky Falconry hold a special permit from U.S. Fish and Wildlife that allow non-licensed falconers the rare opportunity of putting on a glove and free flying our trained birds of prey. We opened about 10 and a half years ago down Anderson Truck Trail, so right on the side of Mount Viejas. And um, we, we, our main mission really is to talk about, to teach people the ancient art of falconry, raptor biology, and conservation, and really pair it with an interactive experience that's pretty unforgettable. So we definitely invite everyone out. Um, you can uh, visit our website. It's on the brochure that you guys have, and a lot of information is on there, and you can also book directly. So we would certainly love to see you guys. And uh, we bought, we were originally renting down Anderson Truck Trail, but we ended up buying a historic ranch there about five and a half years ago. So we are on 40 acres and it's surrounded by national forest. But interestingly enough, we found the original land grant for the property. Yeah, we found it, uh, it was 1896, had Grover Cleveland signature on it. Didn't say let's go Grover or anything like that. Um, <laughs> But we're on 40 acres of the historic 160 acre ranch and we actually used to live on the other side of the historic ranch so we've got to live on both sides um but talking to one of my viejas buddies uh, interesting story um back then the uh, ranch was uh had a, a settler dude and a native woman that lived there and well he wasn't allowed on the res and she wasn't allowed in town so it was the love shack in the middle so <laughs> And uh, we call that critical history, no theory about it. <laughs> and uh, so it's a pretty interesting spot. We actually have um, some of the old ruins of the homestead on the ranch. Um, so, and like a root cellar that's pretty well preserved. So it's pretty neat to go uh, see the, some of that old construction. It's not huge or anything. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I moved here in 2010 uh, to pursue mm -hmm. falconry and paragliding. Uh, I wanted to fly with the birds uh, in the paraglider, which I got to do. It was incredible. And to train them, I started doing hawk walks on the side of the mountain there. Uh, and I was like, well, this is way too much fun, a lot less weather dependent and a lot safer. And uh, here we are. And my, my background before that was a videographer at, for National Geographic Lindblad Expedition. So I got to work in places like Galapagos and Antarctica, where I really started to fall in love with birds. Um, as well as paragliding when you go up and share the, the thermos with them. So um, now. Yeah, so Kirk and I actually met through the sport and um, again opened our school together 10 and a half years ago. Yeah. So without further ado, yeah, we're but, actually. Yeah, no, but, oh. but really quick, uh, okay. yeah, to talk about what we do really quick is we go on interactive hikes uh, on the ranch where we fly the birds through the rocks, the hills, the trees. You get really cool long flights, uh, see more like innate behaviors. It's like a raptor adventure and it's our uh, favorite thing to do. But does anybody here actually know what falconry actually is? No, raise a wing. What's that? Okay, definitely part of it. But what is the main goal? You got yeah. it, that's simple. So as long as you get hunting with a raptor in there, I'm okay with that definition. However, the snooty definition of the sport is the taking of quarry and its natural habitat <laughs> with a trained raptor and all the training upkeeper husbandry that goes into it. So uh, hunting with a raptor. And the types that we use in the sport are some species of eagles, owls, hawks, falcons, and believe it or not, a few species of old world vultures. Now, so, so any guesses on how old falconry is? Ooh, somebody was listening during yeah. class. Yeah. Man, well, 
we actually know through recent evidence that it does date back somewhere between 10 and 12,000 years ago. So been around for a very, very long time. We actually do not think it had a strong presence here in the Americas until after the Great World Wars. Our boys that were lucky enough to make it back saw the sport being practiced abroad and brought it back home with them. So as far as we know, the First Nations people here did not practice falconry. Perhaps they did, but there's not a lot of strong evidence pointing to that. So pretty new here to the America. Yeah. Now let's uh, pull out one of the stars of the hour here. And what you're all really here to see. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there we go. Step up. Yeah, Absolutely, of yeah. course. Just no flash because flat they have a really sensitive eye. Yeah, so. let me trade you sides. Yeah. And so any guesses on what type of bird we've got here? Eagle, owl, hawk? Anyone besides the front row? <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. Is he right? You got it. Oh. So she is a Harris's hawk, yeah. all right, like Kamala, all right? And she's a broadwing style, just like a red tail, okay? So she is a cousin of the red tail. She <laughs> likes to check it out, yeah. And okay. uh, yeah, she moved to Alpine in 2010 as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Harris's hawks, this is one of the main species that we use with sky falconry because they are really unique to the world of raptors. They are actually among the few large mm -hmm. pack hunting raptor species that we have in the entire world. There are other, a few other uh, pack hunting species that have evolved oh, on yeah. small island chains, but really for mainland, it's the Harris's hawk. And that um, inherent kind of communal behavior is what makes them so great at working with the public. So we do spend about six months training our birds pretty much on a daily basis before we introduce them into our um, school programs with the public. So Shanti has been uh, working with the public um, now for about 10 years. She's, uh, she's the OG of Sky Falconry. And uh, <laughs> any guesses on how much she weighs? Anyone? Just shout it out if you have two. Okay. All right, two you're on the right track. Yeah, she's two and a quarter pounds. We're we're gonna hire this guy. Yeah, I know. We're gonna let you come up and do the talk. Yeah. Now, uh, so so she's got fluffy down, hollow boned, feather weight. All the feathers there don't even make up fifteen percent of her body weight. Believe it or not. Okay. Now we do have a couple males of our species and they're only around a pound and a half. So the ladies are always larger. She's over a head taller and beefier than those boys. So the ladies rule the raptor world. Yeah. And if it was out in the human world, we might have the world peace by now, but that's a different class. You know, you guys didn't sign up for that one today. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> um, let's see here. Well, Harris's hawks have really revolutionized the sport of falconry. Typically, falcon, falconry is a pretty solitary sport. When you're flying birds of prey and birds of prey in the wild, they really live alone, fly alone, hunt alone, unless it's nesting and mating season. And they're still not cooperatively hunting together. They're taking turns, right, hunting for the babies. So when you're flying Harris's hawks and you go out in the field with your buddies and you all have Harris's, you can literally pull them out at the same time and they will instinctually cooperate to hunt and take down game, even if they don't know each other. So they really are quite incredible um, species. Yes. So good question. So most hawks, except for short-winged hawks, hunt uh, ground quarry. So when we're hunting as falconers with uh, broad-winged hawks like Harris's and red tails, we're normally going after cottontail, jackrabbit. You can sometimes hunt quail with these guys too. Um, and uh, but mostly cottontail and jackrabbit. Now they hunt everything. They are what we call opportunistic. So if we're out trying to hunt, you know, jackrabbit and a a little, you know, mouse or gopher pops that set up, they're definitely going for it or a squirrel, right? So can't really control what they hunt, but yeah, she's trying to after, encourage yeah. them towards the right prey. Yeah, she's even gone after a wild turkey. Yeah, and uh, yeah, yeah, and if you have a chicken coop. Uh, she's definitely yeah, a chicken killer. Yeah, and if you guys see a bird that looks like this in town, let us know. Call us. Yeah, 
<laughs> Especially if she's on your chicken coop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We used to have a vulture. He would go, like, we'd launch him from the side of the hill back there, and he'd be, like, flying over Alpine for, like, 45 minutes. Seriously. You he probably black visited dot. all of you guys. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so any questions about the Harris's house? Yeah. So they can live to be 20 to 30 plus in captivity, um, and they'll probably fly that whole time. Uh, and a lot of times, like in falconry, uh, like if she wants to stop working, you know, maybe around 26, uh, 27 or so, uh, then she gets to retire and, and live the fat life. But that's a, a good uh, segue to talk about the life cycle of the raptors. We'll talk about the red tail hawk, which is our most common species here. They cover all the lower 48, so quite ubiquitous. But like all raptors, they are actually one of the fastest growing animals on the planet because they go from jumbo chicken egg size to around three pounds in five weeks. Yeah, it's a total mind bomb and it blows my mind every time I see it because if you go back to that nesting area once a week, those little babies, they look like totally different creatures. And in fact, for a time before that five weeks, they're actually bigger than you see full grown because they're on the nest. They're getting fed by mommy and daddy, storing up energy to grow those final flight feathers. <laughs> So by this point, the nest is getting pretty crowded, and it is just like having a bunch of uncoordinated Edward scissor hands for children. Yeah, a little dangerous down there. So from now on, the parents will just toss that food in the nest. They hang out on a branch nearby, and they watch them go at it. They're like, good luck down there, Johnny's, or something, right? So that's why at three... Oh, and she missed the towel. I know. Oh, it's okay. We'll clean it up. Yeah. Uh, yeah, don't worry. It's magical poop. Yeah. We can talk. Um, so, but that's why at... at Three months old only, the parents get so sick of the begging and the screaming and the grabbing it, they give them the boot, kick them out of that nesting area, totally cut off. Good luck in the economy. I hope you make it at three months old. Mm -hmm. All right? Now, you're a pretty, pretty smart guy. How old are you, then? Uh, about to turn nine. Okay. You ready to go out and get a job? <laughs> no? All right. Smart lad. You might just make it. Well, try getting that job at just three months old. Okay? Pretty tough. So that's why I am sorry to say that you're number one. Over 50% of all raptors will die. Yeah, they get in flying accidents, hunting accidents. They simply starve to death. And then with less experience out there, they do get predated upon more so. So they can get it from the usual customers like a bobcat, coyote, or fox. You know, don't get out foxed, all right? That's why she listens to NPR, yeah, <laughs> even during Pledge Week. Yeah, she did show uh, some real dedication a couple months ago. She really wanted that tote bag for the bunny, you know, <laughs> hide it from her brother. Uh, even a raccoon could take you down as well as other raptors like the golden eagle, peregrine falcon. But believe it or not, their biggest predator out there is the great horned owl. Yeah. So these guys are diurnal, which means they see great during the day, but at night, not so good. So as soon as it gets dark, they just want to go up into their roost, hang out as calmly as possible, hope the boogie owl doesn't come and snatch them out of there. That's how it goes down. You're number two of the less than 50% survivors, another 25% go down. You're number three, another 25%. So if we were all young raptors in here, we'd be really lucky if like seven or eight of us made it to three years old. And if you make it that long with that much more experience out there from this point on, you're more likely to make it to the average age of 10. But again, in captivity, birds the size of the red tails and the Harris's, they can make it to 20, 30 plus years old, God willing. Of course, with good veterinary coverage too. So not only do they face all of the natural obstacles Kirk just mentioned, but it is really important to stress all of the man-made obstacles as well. So they will utilize a uh, flight technique called the ground effect when they are flying and hunting. So they will swoop really close to the ground and glide, locking in on what they're going after or what their destination is. And they don't look both ways before they cross the street and they often get hit by cars. One thing that you guys can do to help prevent that is please do not ever throw anything out your car window. A lot of us think it's okay if it's biodegradable like an apple core. You're actually drawing the prey animals that these birds hunt to the roadside, perpetuating that whole cycle of them hunting there and getting hit. Poisons. I cannot stress it enough how incredibly uh, dangerous poisons are. We're seeing secondary poisoning issues now with all of our predators. Raptors simply cannot survive being poisoned. So when you poison their prey and they eat it, they in turn get poisoned, right? Raptors and most predators prefer to go after more vulnerable prey. So if it is dead or dying or maimed, 
they're going for it, right? They will also unknowingly bring that prey back to the nest and the entire nest will die. I really hope that you guys can spread that message through your communities and neighborhoods. It is just really, really important. Yeah. We're actually seeing our domestic animals, our children, and this poison really seeping into the ecosystem and having a pretty profound effect. Yeah, and uh, each one of these predator birds can eat over a thousand mice or gophers in a year. So yeah. way more effective to have the predators around than the poisons. So, oh, she's sharing? <laughs> yeah. Sharing's caring. Yeah. So, also, yeah, so that includes spraying chemicals on your plant lawn up to large agricultural levels. We actually know a falconry bird personally that was killed when the neighbor sprayed Roundup on his lawn and it wafted over to the bird's hawk house next door, right? He died right there in the safest place he could have been. Flying into glass windows getting lead poisoning from eating something that's been shot with lead bullets, or gut piles that are left in the field after large game has been shot, as well as electrocution kill billions of birds every year. And one of the fastest growing killers of not just raptors, but birds at large are actually wind turbines. So we definitely have a lot to think about as far as our future <laughs> energy needs go. What a lot of people do not know is that all of our native raptor species to North America are protected under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Even to possess one single feather of a native raptor can be up to a $15,000 fine. Up that to killing one, destroying their nest, eggs, etc. It is considered a felony with heavy fines for individuals and corporations. Unfortunately, these environmental laws, like many, are very vulnerable to getting rolled back we love to introduce people uh, to organizations that are doing incredible work, not only in our legislations to protect birds, uh, but also in the field as well. Yeah, one of course is Audubon. Most of us have heard of them. Also the American Bird Conservancy doing great work in the courts and legislation, but also the Peregrine Fund. Have any of you guys heard of them before? How about the Peregrine Falcon? <clears throat> so by the 60s, we actually almost lost that fastest animal on the planet, the Peregrine Falcon clocked in at 240 plus miles an hour. And in fact, by the summer of love, the eastern seaboard variety of peregrines was completely wiped out, gone forever. The western seaboard variety here was on massive decline, down to tens of birds. But because falconers had them in captivity, got together, started this group, and figured out how to breed them in captivity, we think for the first time in working with them for thousands of years, got permission from the government to release them. Happy to report as of 2012, they're now at or higher than historic numbers, in some cases double. So very quickly, we can have a positive impact on the natural world around us if we so choose and learn how to do new things. And you kiddos are super lucky because when I was your age, I grew up in Seattle. We had to go to Canada to go see a bald eagle with regularity. And now we got them uh, back in the city and all the lower 48 and right down here at Little El Cap and uh, in the lakes down there. So unbelievable. Yes. What about the wind turbine? Yeah. Yes, definitely is. Um, yeah, even some of my 200-pound paragliding buddies have almost been sucked in there. So a two-pound bird dangerous. doesn't have much of a chance. Uh, and especially yeah. the eagles uh, are <laughs> somewhat more susceptible. Um, but it's even worse for bats. So they just get uh, kind of close to them, and it kind of changes the, the pressure in there, and they, like, kind of... Implode. Yeah. Sort of. yeah, yeah, as well as getting sucked in. So the protection we're talking about... <clears throat> Yes. How does that equate with wind turbines? Yeah, so... Um, yeah, even during the Obama administration, they, uh, like, waived some of those protections. You know, so, uh, so. Why, yeah, why we like to stress... So, the really, the only reason why we're seeing really healthy populations in raptors right now is because of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. We did almost lose so many species beyond, of course, just the peregrine falcon. So... When uh, corporations are held liable for the kills that they have, they have to pay out funds. And so when we have natural disasters like oil spills and things like that, the money that co comes to clean those up really come from a lot of those regulations and fines that are paid and whatnot. And so there are inspectors that go out to oil pits and farms and, and whatnot to really try to track the kills that they're they're having yeah. right and the wind turbines are the fastest growing killer of raptors but they're definitely still not the highest 
We still have electrocution uh, being like number one, typically most places in the world. Uh, lead bullets and glass windows and yeah. the pesticides are still higher than um, than the wind turbines. And a, another birds. issue with the wind turbines, and we are all about uh, you know green energy, which is really important, but. Typically, we do put these wind farms where the wind is the strongest, which also happens to be the migratory bird paths, right? Because they will travel on those natural wind currents. And so it gets a little tricky when you, yeah, try to find the balance between the two. Yeah. Any, Any other questions? There's a big baby whale. Quail. Oh, yeah. Quail. Yes. Yeah. Uh, chopped up. I did name him Dan before I chopped him up. Yeah. So uh, we'd like to give our birds kind of a variety of food. That way they stay super healthy. Some people will even supplement with vitamins and such, but we don't really do that with our birds. So they typically have kind of a rotation diet between quail, bunny, mice, little day old chickens that are rejects from the egg industry. And, um, and then everything that they kind of hunt naturally when we're out with them in the field. Yeah. Squirrels and lizards and all the things. Yeah, speaking of which, you want to give me a couple of mice? Oh, do you guys want to watch her eat? Is that going to freak you guys out? <laughs> okay, close your eyes if this is going to freak you out. So why you don't want to poison the mice, of course, is, uh, well, they eat them. Yeah. See how fast she got that? And I've been grabbed before. Let me get him one more. Yeah. So these guys can swallow small prey whole, uh, but if they feel comfortable, uh, they are going to tear the prey up, right? And so she obviously feels incredibly comfortable. Oh, 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 oh. You can okay. see that she, and there it goes, <laughs> whole. So they have a double hinge jaw like a snake. Yeah, and she's doing that mantling. Yeah. So if you see, she's starting to kind of drop her. Um, oh, you can see. Oh. He, uh, she's trying to drop her wings around. So raptors do uh, an instinctual behavior called mantling. So when they're on prey in the field, they'll typically create a little tent around it to protect it from little, other raptors. She had a little trouble there. Yeah. Poor guy. He's like, oh, yeah. And uh, yeah, one time, as you saw, like that's very dangerous for me throwing the uh, mouth at her like that. Um, but she trusts my hand because I've never taken anything away from her. But she's going with it for by instinct. And one time, I was flying with her in my paraglider from uh, Laguna Mountain down to the Butterfield Ranch, and uh, she followed me all the way down. I was really excited, and uh, you know, after like the third attempt, you know, a couple failed attempts beforehand, and uh, some searches for her flying off after that so i was really excited and i was feeding her a little day old chicken and so i went to go give it to her with my other hand and she grabbed me right here and so i had one hand grabbing one of one foot right here tight and then right here through my bare hand grabbing on and you could hear my screams alone in the desert you know? uh, yeah so it's a humbling sport you know yeah. you think you're gonna do something all cool and then they just humble you this two pounder so um, I do kind of want, while we're um, watching her enjoy her uh, well-deserved meal, today is her Friday. Um, so we always feed them really fat on Friday. Um, it's like a Gallagher show here, though. I want <laughs> except for it's not uh, watermelons. You know? <laughs> so I do want to talk a little bit about the sport, too, and our relationships with our birds. So these birds do not love us, right? They don't even really have those mechanisms in their brain to express love and affection and all of those. So our relationship as falconers with our birds is really built on trust and positive reinforcement, right? So we're constantly out free flying our birds and really it is their choice if the relationship continues. And I think that's really important to um, point out. Uh, she is, <laughs> though she is a falconry bird and she is trained, she actually is still completely wild. We got her when she was about seven months old. And so she had learned all of her healthy, natural raptor behaviors before we started working with her. And for most raptor species in the sport, that's really what we want, right? It's really important that they have that fight or flight instinct, right? So that way, if she gets angry or irritated or something goes down, her instincts to fly away 
and not turn around and attack a human, right? So, um, okay. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> it's a dirty job, you know. Yeah, and uh, this, uh, and I want to reiterate, this is a working relationship of toleration only. I don't know if you guys have had a relationship like that before, but why uh, for these birds? Yeah, is because they do not like to be touched. Yeah. So I'm sorry to say, there's just no love like a cat or a dog or a parrot. They're not pets. They don't like to be pet. They only tolerate it. See how she's cowering away from that? You're like, torturing me, a punk. Where is my tidbit? Okay. So tidbit is a falconry term. There's a little tidbit for you, as well as the term gentleman. And the root of the word actually means a man that can handle a female falcon. And why? Well, because these birds do not need you. They know how to fly. They know how to hunt. So if you don't have that good working relationship, well, hasta la vista, bud, and I won't be back. So they do have the choice every time we are flying them to leave, right? So it really is important that we try to give them the best life that we possibly can so they are more apt to stick around. But it is really a relationship of choice for them, and I think that's um, important to yeah. point out. Have you had leaves, like your training um, well, it definitely happens when you're training them, especially with young first-year birds when you're, when you're building that relationship. Um, so we, when we fly our birds, we fly them with trackers. We either use radio telemetry or GPS so that when things go down, we do try to find them, right? Um, and so we've gone on major epic bird chase hikes all over Alpine. If you see us climbing through your, you know, yard or something, yeah. it's, <laughs> um, yeah. we have very, a lot of stories to tell about that, but, yeah. um, but yeah, so we do try to find them. So we've probably gone on bird chases with all of our birds. Now, losing birds is definitely a big part of the sport. Not only can they fly away and you never be able to find them, but a lot of things happen as far as them getting killed. So all those obstacles we talked about, wild raptors facing our falconry raptors face the same ones. No. Um, and so we uh, actually knew the bird personally that was killed by the pesticides. We actually had a, a larger female of this species get killed and eaten by another raptor when she was out flying because it is a bird eat bird world out there. Yep. So uh, they are not friends. Um, they don't co-mingle. And then um, we had a really amazing vulture who got chased by ravens out of the territory over Mount Viejas and went down for a roadkill bunny and became roadkill himself. So roadkill is also a big issue with with everyone who eats roadkill, yeah, you see right? it in the street. Just throw it out of the street, and maybe even over that it. person's fence, so it doesn't get drugged back into the road. Yeah. So we, we got another uh, special yeah. species here. Yeah. So this guy uh, is a lanner falcon. Okay, L A N N E R. He's old world, so Europe, Asia, Africa, Middle East, and he looks just like our prairie falcon, uh, which is found a little further east of here. But I'll take him around. He's a little uh, more chill. Uh, yeah, yeah. So the different falcons I was mentioning that brought that uh, oh. broad-winged hawks hunt ground quarry. Short-winged hawks hunt specialize in hunting other birds, and then of course falcons specialize in hunting other birds. So they do have adaptations that allow them to fly faster, farther, higher, better, more than other <laughs> raptors. And it is really to go after the, the prey of other birds and other birds in flight, right? So you can see this guy has long, narrow, pointy wings. Uh, they're so long, they cross in the back and they're like as long as his tail. So that oh, wing that shape guy. is really what allows him part of his aerodynamic abilities, right? Um, but uh, we fly our um, falcon in our private raptor experience. They're not, they're much more advanced falconry birds is what we like to say because of their flight style. So this guy will go coring up thousands of feet, right, during class and fly around and kind of do his thing as a falcon and then come back. But uh, they're super fun to fly, but they definitely get in a lot more trouble. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we call them the Ferrari, yeah. whereas the uh, Hawk is the Ford. But definitely. the Ford is definitely more reliable. Just don't tell uh, the Italians that we said that. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. any questions for us? <laughs> I mean, we can honestly talk about um, raptors and falconry all day long. Yeah. In the ancient times, the most species that they 
they hunted with? So, well, so not necessarily. What, so what the sport, I'll kind of like break down the category for those that might be confused about some of the terms that we are using. So would we say the word raptor, that is kind of a broad category for, um, for, uh, so he is a bird of prey, but not all birds of prey are raptors. So yeah. raptor, yeah, yeah, means. What do you want to give him? He gets a mouse and a chick. Okay. okay. So we're going to feed him to you while we're chatting. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So under the category of raptor falls all birds that hunt with their feet. That is where the power lies, and that is the main hunting weapon. So we've got eagles, owls, hawks, falcons, and some um, old world vultures and ospreys and kites. Right, so the birds that work well with the sport are mainly some eagle species, falcons, and hawks. Owls you'll see kind of spattered about with falconers having them, but they are very difficult to hunt with. And then birds like osprey that specialize in carrying really large food away don't really make good birds for the sport. Uh, so what we want to do when we're hunting with our birds is typically hunt game that's too large for them to fly away with, and we go to them, right? If they can fly away with it, they typically will, right? That's just their instinct. Yeah. So I hope that answers your question. I don't know that there's necessarily different species. Yeah, no, because they, they haven't changed, you in know, like thousands, thousands of years. And, thousands and in of fact, years. this uh, this guy here is one of the members of the oldest falcon species, the hiero Hy falcon family. Um, and so him and the saker falcon, and saker is how you say falcon in Arabic. Um, so these guys are, you know, found in Egypt and North Africa, all up there. And so these guys have been used in the sport for thousands of years. And, and we actually think they probably inspired the god Horus in the, you know, Egyptian iconography. And if you see that dark stripe that they have, all falcons have that dark stripe. That's kind of a signature uh, characteristic of the falcon and it helps deflect the sun. But you really see that design a lot in Egypt, right? The eye of Horus. Um, and Horus kind of being that, that falcon god. And so we are actually just watching a documentary um, in e about Egypt, and there was a lantern falcon like perched up in the pyramid they were filming, and we're yeah. like, oh my god, yeah. it's one of these guys. Yeah. Yes, uh, they, they are a little bit. So we say that if you put the falcon's eyes in a human's head, it'd be the size of baseballs. The hawk is uh, like a tennis ball, and the owl is like a softball. Yeah. So <laughs> raptor, diurnal raptors really navigate the world through their eyesight. They have one of the most advanced eyesights in the animal kingdom. They can see off the spectrum into the UV and thermal waves. Uh, they can, uh, that allows them to kind of pick up urine trails that are reflecting the UV to see where there's fresh prey. He knows all my spots. <laughs> P, P joke. They can see those hot columns of air, the thermals rising in the sky. Their motto is really to conserve energy. So when they look out and the thermals have started kind of rising up from the earth, it literally looks like shoots and ladders out there to them, right? And they can just make a beeline for one of those thermals and be able to core it circling without having to exert any energy. So a lot of people think when they see wild raptors circling that they're circling prey, they're actually just riding those natural currents of air to conserve energy. They're probably hunting, but it's not that they're circling prey per se. Yeah. yeah. What's uh, that? Yeah. So this guy weighs a pound, and the female weighs in his of his species about a pound and a half. So typically, the females are a third larger than the males across the board for raptors. Yeah. Did you have a question? Yeah, I, I was just wondering. This is a bird from the old world. Yes. He was yeah. bred here in California, just like many of you. Yeah, uh -huh. <laughs> so, he, so um, as licensed falconers, so falconry is really one of the most highly regulated hunting sports we have in the country, and it is considered a hunting sport. So Kirk and I are considered what are called master falconers. 
Um, and that takes um, seven years of experience to become a master. And we've both been practicing the sport for over a decade. When at different stages of being a falconer, you're allowed by the government to have different kind of species and different numbers of species at the same time. So um, a, some birds you can trap from the wild and that's all highly regulated. And once you get to a certain point, you can also start purchasing exotic species. Now for beyond the state permits that we hold, our falconry license and our hunting license for the state of California, we then hold our federal education permit. And through that, we're required by the government to have captive bred birds for our interactive programs that we do with the public. But there is a big difference between saying captive bred and raised by humans. So going back to what I said earlier, we usually like to get them still when they're older and have learned their raptor behaviors from their like parental raptor unit before we start working with them. Some birds you can imprint on humans, but you really have to know what you're doing to make them healthy and not develop kind of dangerous behaviors. Yeah, another one? Yeah, give me a doc. Okay. Yeah. Typically sight is what they're going after, but their hearing is kind of secondary to their sight. So their hearing is definitely better than ours. So. They can certainly hear something and then kind of lock in on it. And I don't know if you've seen these guys while they're out this morning. Uh, the hawk will kind of do her head like this and the falcon will go up and down. And so they'll either hear something or see something and then they'll triangulate on it. So they do a little bit of geometry, checking point A and B to see how far away C is, right? So they kind of use both, but, but their superpower is that eyesight. So that they can see prey from really far away and when they're up in, in flight. Yeah. When you say hunting, when you think about hunting, they're finding your prey and they're bringing it back. No, no. So we, yes. So, great question. So we try to, if he gets like the little mouse, you better bet he's going to take it and fly away with it. These guys are notorious carriers and they will all do that. So they're never typically going to ever bring it back to you. So we try to hunt stuff that's too big for them to fly with. And we go to them, like on the bunny, and then we have to trade them off of it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And you go out looking for bunnies, and, you know, she'll get rats or mice and a squirrel. squirrel and just take it away. And so these guys can eat over 25% of their body weight. It's amazing. Yeah. Could you guys imagine eating that much? Then could you imagine flying after that? So once they've done that, they just want to go to their roost and digest and want nothing to do with us. They are officially then fed up. And that is where the term comes from. So yeah, we get a lot of cool terms from the sport, like wrapped around my finger, under my thumb. Uh, he's plucking. Uh, hobby is a species of old world falcon. So go get yourself a hobby means go get yourself a falcon. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, they could, yes. um, but there's usually not going to be that many at once that'll escape. Um, and uh, they won't really affect the wild populations too bad. But there is a wild population of Harris's hawks uh, that have escaped in England. And they're not from there. And uh, they're like cruising around. And they've actually been known to take down baby roe deer. And they're yeah. hunting in packs. Yeah. Yeah, so back to the Harris's hawk quickly on that note, if you do go to England or Ireland or Scotland and you go do a falconry experience at a castle, which is usually where they have them, you're going to fly a Harris's hawk, a North American species, because of that communal behavior, right? The yeah. lanner falcon has a really incredible disposition, which is also why he is one of the birds that we fly and work with the public with. You can tell just by his behavior here on the glove, he's like a total sweetheart. His name's Habibi. Um, he's our little golden boy. Yeah. Oh, take it back. Well, there. we've got a special treat yeah. for you guys to kind of wrap it up here. Um, and we're going to see how this guy is going to do. Um, this will be like his first big, big yeah. group. So we have no idea what's going to happen. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> bear with us here. Yeah. And uh, um, 
So we'll see. So he's um, our new, uh, well, we've had him for a little over a year now. We got him from our sister school in Northern California. Um, and he is a great horned owl. So we, have, we don't, haven't been flying him in big groups. We've only been using him in our uh, smaller uh, private classes, and he's been doing a great job. But owls tend to get spooked a lot more. So, oh, uh, and especially during the daytime, uh, mm -hmm. then their natural instinct is just to go hide. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, because they can kind of see through the little cracks in their door. Oh, no, do you uh, want to come spin her around, actually? Shanti? Yeah, sure. Um, so when when Sean, I could hear Shanti bouncing around the hawk when she saw the falcon eating. So, um, well, I'll wait. Hi, buddy. Yeah. And Shanti, the hawk, wants to eat the owl and the falcon. Oh, no. You're okay. Yeah. You're okay. Yeah. You're okay. Step back. Step back. So we'll see how he does. He yeah, might he not can, do good. Yeah, but give him a second. <laughs> Let's give it a try. And, okay, um, you're okay. Yep, that's good okay, noises. Okay. You're okay. You're okay. Good, buddy. You're okay. Good boy, Tigger. You're okay, love. Good boy. Good yeah. perch perch. Good perch perch. You're okay, love. Yeah. So this is the, the great horned owl, and he yeah. is our largest bird of prey yeah. here in North America, and they are basically yeah. the eagle of the night, okay? They are the top of the top, again, the biggest predator for the red tails and the Harris's yeah. hawks, so that's why they hate the owl so much. Um, yeah, and uh, so Ooh. nothing can dominate them at night. Yeah. Yeah, isn't he gorgeous? His name is Tigger. We call him Tig, and he is a male great horned owl, and he weighs in about two and a quarter pounds. So the females of his species are going to be around three pounds. Yeah, so believe it or not, he actually is just a little bit lighter than the big hawk that you saw. Yeah, even he's just fluffy. Hi, huh, buddy. <laughs> And he is like all these people yeah, there. Yeah, he I? wants to go up there. What is happening? Yeah. Uh, so you can see this guy's feather structure is significantly different than the uh, diurnal raptors that we just had out. So this guy is literally feathered from plumicorn. These are not his ears. They're called plumicorns all the way down to his talons, right? And this feather structure really helps him be completely silent in flight. Right. They also have different uh, feather structure for each individual feather where they kind of have a velvet covering on the top. And then around the edges is like a fine tooth comb. And all of that helps really break the air so that, again, he's completely silent in flight. So this guy is quite the, uh, oh, you're doing so good, buddy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Isn't he cool? Oh my God. So yeah, we are, um, uh, if you want to work with TIG, we do work with all three species in our private raptor experience. Again, he's good with small groups, but um, this is probably, this may be his first big group. We don't yeah. really know. And uh, yeah. Yeah, so, and owls, we say, are a lot harder to train um, because it's not that they've quit evolving, but they've basically stayed the same for the past 60 million years like a shark. Yeah. So they're sharks are even yeah. older, I think, but it's pretty uh, incredible. Yeah. So sometimes you can be handed with a whole mouse. You're like, hey, come on, buddy. And he's just like, mm. <laughs> so uh, a little yeah. more challenging to hunt yeah. with, but really incredible to work yeah. with and build and a relationship. Try, let's try to give him one of those mice yeah. and see what hey, happens here. And this guy, hey, if he feels comfortable enough to eat it, it's going to go down in about 2.2 seconds <gasps> when he decides. Oh, oh. Yeah. So you hear those, uh, those are like the baby baggy You're going to hold it? Oh, and you're going to eat here it. Go. Here it goes. Oh, wow. That fast. Yeah. And, the, and this is why you want these guys around and why yeah. you don't, definitely don't want to poison the mice. Hi, Bubba. Yeah. yeah. You gonna get we'll it try now? a second one. Sometimes he'll hold on to it and yeah. stash it. He and he does have a local cute. girlfriend. Uh, oh, she likes jailbirds. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. You're going to hold yeah. that one? And uh, we think he, like, saves food for her sometimes. But they are pretty loud at night sometimes yeah. during. Yeah, so these guys are really active during the full moon and kind of brighter moon phases. And of, <laughs> of course, <laughs> hey, bud, yeah. you made something sticking out of your mouth. Yeah. That's, uh, have you guys seen Lady and the Tramp? There it is. <laughs> yeah. You still got a little bit, bud. Yeah. Yeah. 
So those eyeballs of him, they're pretty striking, his eyes. Um, so for the great horned owl, they have really incredible hearing. They also surprisingly have really good eyesight as well, but their eyes do take up 70% of their brain pan. Um, and they are fixed in his head. So you'll often see owls spin their head around. They can spin their head around about 270 degrees in both directions. And that's because they have 14 cervical vertebra, where almost all mammals have seven, right? So they have double the number of cervical vertebra that we do. But that rotation really helps compensate for that lack of eyeball movement, right? So the eyes are fixed in his head. <laughs> yeah, and they look like just like, like old TV tubes. So it's not a ball, it's a tube like this. Yeah. yeah. Oh my goodness, guys. So any question, any other questions yeah. for us? Yes. Yeah, so we call these guys crepuscular hunters. So they're going to be most active um, during twilight time. So right before sunrise, right after sunset, and then fuller moon phases. So they do tend to need a little bit uh, of light to hunt. So full moon, super active. And then, of course, if you live in an area where there's artificial lighting all night long, you may see them being active throughout the night, even if the moon is, say, a new moon, right? So this doesn't go for every single owl species. But in general, the color of their eyes is going to tell you kind of what type of hunters they are. So the big golden eyes like that are usually the crepuscular hunters. When they have black eyes or dark eyes like the barn owl, they can hunt in pitch black. And then also the golden eyes, I believe, are the ones that are, let's see, golden eyes are also crepuscular. And then there are lighter colored eyes that are diurnal owls. So we actually have diurnal owls as well. Not all of them are night hunters. And that's kind of like a broad yes over there general thing oh these guys yeah the hooter oh, if you hear them hooting that's, that's a, a great, great horn. horn yeah 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 if it hoots it's the great horn yeah the barn owls kind of have a more screechy hissing sound but they're the ones with the moon face and they don't have the little tufts right here, which are feathers called plumicorns. We didn't know what you were doing. Yeah, it's hard to say. So if you do not know the sex of a raptor, you always refer to them in the feminine because the females rule the raptor world. Yeah. Yes, back there. The barn owls are. These guys are always like a camouflage like this, right? The barn owl. Okay. Yep. Oh, yeah. It's really great if you have the. Yeah, they're completely silent. Barn owls are fantastic to have and a great way for doing rodent control if you put up an owl box. Barn owls are typically going to be the ones that move into that. And barn owls are unique in their breeding in that they can have up to like 14 babies in a year. And they'll keep kind of laying eggs throughout the season. So for rodent control, barn owls are amazing. And they can even hear gophers under the ground and punch through the ground to grab them. I mean, they're like spectacular at hunting gophers. So yeah. great and, that you have the barn owls. Yeah, around. and these guys even eat barn owls, and they dissected like a dead great horn that had like a barn owl inside of it, and then inside the barn owl was like a screech owl. Like little nesting dolls. Yeah, and then, uh, yeah, so, but in Alpine, nesting we owls. definitely, yeah, we definitely have the great horns, and then um, we don't have the barn owls up. We're a few hundred feet higher than the town, um, but I think you guys have some barn owls here and definitely mm -hmm. more in down lower elevations for those. But I have seen burrowing mm -hmm. owls at Wright's Field, which I was very shocked and excited. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. The, well, the falcon, I mean, none of these guys is as fast as the peregrine, which is the fastest animal. Uh, they break terminal velocity. 
Um, what do you want? I'm going to put them. Yeah. Um, so these guys, we don't think, go faster than 120, 140 miles an hour. We have clocked the Falcon, who we fly with the GPS, at 105. Um, so, yeah. Um, but the, the Lantern Falcons have a pretty good horizontal speed. Uh, and they even hunt bats, which have the fastest horizontal speed of any of the flyers. So, yeah. Pretty crazy. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. We just have these three species right now. Yep. So we have four Harris's hawks, two falcons, and the one owl. Yep. They're really the best ones for interactive programs that we offer where we're free flying birds. Um, and that's kind of our, our specialty as opposed to just sort of having the bird on the glove and, and talking about it. Yeah. How, how many uh, birds do you think are for you? Uh, as far as wild raptors or? Oh, well, God. it's more about what Kirk and I can support. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so we have had up to eight, eight birds at the same time. And that is like, for us, it's full on because of the, uh, the amount of time that we spend training and working with them. So seven, we have seven right now. And that's kind of a sweet number. Eight six. is like, he really wants to have six, but... Yeah, it's really challenging. <laughs> so for the sport, it's easy to collect birds because you're always wanting to work with new species or try new birds. And for us, we really don't want to have more birds than we can fly and hunt and train, you know, pretty much on the daily because we don't think it's fair to them, right? Yeah. Um, but at a rehab situation like Sky Hunters, uh, Nancy Connie, who is on the other side of town, she would have, you know, rehabbing like hundreds of owls at a time. Yeah. So that's kind of a different jam. Yeah. So, yeah. So for us, we're, we're at our sweet spot right now. Eight, eight max. Seven's good. Yeah. So, yeah, we say for like a golden eagle, which is around 10 pounds, means about 10 square miles. Um, and then these guys, uh, they could survive on a couple square miles, no problem, maybe less. But they do go beyond that because they fly. And they, they cross over their, their territory. Uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. But They, they would, could kill each other, too. Yeah. 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 But in the wild, we have all the different hawks and owls out. Uh, but they hunt each other. Yeah. So, so it really... What we like to say about raptors is they are barometers for the ecosystem. So being apex predators of the sky, when we look at raptors and we see what's going on with them, it really tells us what's happening on a larger scale within our ecosystem. And so drought years, for example, raptors will, will see less numbers because there's less prey. And they'll also get incredibly territorial because they are protecting the rare you know hunting grounds that they do have yeah like our falcons will get predated upon more so by the wild hawks yeah then. falconers birds will you know really see a, a lot higher attacks and then where we're having abundant prey years like right now because of all the rains so everything's really interconnected so we're seeing a lot more raptor species and they're all flourishing more because there's more abundance of prey so for our, you know, mountain, the side of the mountain that we drive every day, pretty much on a daily basis, we see a red tail, we hear the great horned owls, we see kestrels, and there's a little short winged hawk that yeah, all kind of lives. Cooper's am shark chin. Yeah, and so, yeah. you know, they will share territory and cross over, but they can also yeah. and we, kill and eat each other, right? So yeah, and, that, and actually, uh, and sometimes there is even more bird species in towns. Uh, and for example, the peregrine falcon has twice the diet available to it in the city than the country peregrine. So it's just like alpine. There's no, you know, Thai, Thai restaurant or Indian. Indian food, you know. So there's more, <laughs> no more exotic birds in the city. <laughs> yeah. Well, guys, we have absolutely loved being here with you today. Um, hopefully you've learned some stuff. We would love to see you out at the ranch. We also do offer gift certificates online. They make for excellent holiday gifts. We also have a little online shop where you can buy some swag. Um, but it is quite the adventure and really such an experience to free fly these guys and see their innate behaviors and really experience it up close. Um, our class ages range from six and up. 
And we do have different classes that we offer. So kind of depending on age groups and mobility issues, um, we've got kind of a whole array. So we would love to see you guys. We will be hanging out for a few more minutes if you guys do have questions after the talk. But um, thank you again yeah. for coming. And did you guys so have some good. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Did you guys have anything else that you're going over? Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you guys. Super fun. Oh, yay. Oh, good, good, good. Well, we've, we've loved it. So yeah. thanks for inviting us and thanks for everybody taking the time out of your busy lives to, yeah. to join us this afternoon. We love meeting more Alpinians. I know. <laughs> Not most many of, of most us. of our people come from all over the world and LA and, and so when we get Alpinians, we're like, yes! Yeah. yeah. Locals! <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Take you. care, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Yeah.